God raised Jesus from the dead. I face this world, I face life, I face whatever happens tomorrow, I face my own death and I come to it with this conviction that God raised Jesus from the dead, God will raise me from the dead. He will raise all his people from the dead. We come with that conviction. As Christians, we profess to believe that nothing is impossible with God. So what happens when we face a trial that seems truly insurmountable? When we strive for a goal that by all reasonable standards is impossible to attain? Today on No Falling Word, we'll learn that God calls us to have bold, audacious faith. Welcome to No Falling Word with Liam Gallagher. To learn more about this program, to support this ministry, or to receive your free MP3 download of a message entitled Solus Christus, call 1-800-488-1888. That number again is 1-800-488-1888. Did you know that there are some decisions that we actually don't have to pray about? That may sound odd, but let's listen in as Dr. Gallagher presents proof of that statement from his teaching out of 1 Samuel chapter 14. These two characters that emerge in the chapter, in this particular chapter of the story, illustrate someone who is getting increasingly religious the further he gets away from God, Saul, and one man who demonstrates from the very outset of the story that he has the heart of the matter in him. He understands God, and he has a living relationship with God, and he exercises real faith in God. Two men, father and son, couldn't be further apart in terms of their relationship with God. Well, we look at the story, and we begin with the story of Jonathan. Jonathan, who's been introduced in the previous chapter, previous chapter, which just tells us that there was uh, this young man, without identifying him as, as uh, Saul's son, who defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba. Now we're going back to that incident. It's an action replay. We're being told more about how this action took place. And it was quite an exciting action, as we shall see. My first point is the audacity of faith. The chapter begins with Saul sitting and Jonathan moving. That's been the shape of things up to this point. Uh, Saul hesitant, taking a back seat when he should be taking the lead, and that's what he's doing. And we'll see in a moment where he is. Because circumstances have a habit of paralyzing King Saul. But Jonathan takes decisive action. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let's go over to this Philistine garrison on the other side. And then we're given a a bit of teasing information here, but he did not tell his father. That's your first clue that the information, the action that's going to take place here is going to be interesting. Here is a man who's contemplating action. That's new in the story. A man who's going to show leadership. And the first thing we discover as we read the story is that he realizes that the one person in the country that should be leading them hasn't been leading them, and that no leadership was going to come from that quarter. The narrator who's telling us the story gives us an insight into Saul's situation. Saul was staying, we're told, in the outskirts of Gibeah, in the pomegranate cave at Migron, and the people who were with him were 600 men. Tells us several things about Saul. Tells us that Saul was in hiding when he should have been out fighting the enemy. Tells us that he was in hiding in a cave with his people. He was hoping, he was doing what every other Jew or every other Israelite had done. We were told in the previous chapter, everybody had just ran, scattered because of the enormity of the Philistine army, and Saul was doing the same. Tells us thirdly that Saul had counted his resources. He had 600 men, and he's up against tens of thousands of Philistines, and he's afraid. So there's Saul, the king, in hiding with his men, realizing he's overwhelmed and outnumbered, doing nothing. He's in the cave with another man who is mentioned, a man called Ahijah. We know a little bit about this man's family tree. We know that he's the grandson of 
Eli, and if you've been following the action-packed story so far, you will know, but the visitors won't, that Eli was the priest of Israel and that he's been depriested. He's been, uh, he's dead now, but he had been, had the priesthood taken away from him and his family. So here is, here are a couple of rejects in this cave. There's a rejected priestly family and there's a rejected kingly family and they're all together in the cave hiding from the enemy. And there is one man who has a vision. And that one man is Jonathan. And what a vision it is. It's not an easy thing that he comes up with. Look at verse 4. Apparently, this garrison was on top of a, a hill. There was a pass between two hills, the hill, I think, that he's on and the hill that the garrison is on. In verse 4, there's a rocky crag on one side, a rocky crag on the other side. And one of them is called Boses, which means slippery. And the name of the other one, Senna, means thorny. So there are brambles and thorns on one side, and there's a slippy slope on the other side. And Jonathan has to get from one side to the other. We don't know whether he is to come down through the brambles and then climb up the slippery slope, or whether he is to come skidding down the slippery side and then climb through the brambles. But that's the topographical situation of the, of the opportunity that he faces. And he comes up with the idea, you, that, and he shares it with his uh, armor bearer. What we're going to do is we're going to get from here to there, we're going to go down there, go up there, and we're going to hide. And uh, when we get there, he has a plan. We're going to hide behind a bush, and when we see the soldiers in the fort above our heads, we're going to leap out and go, Yaha! Or words to that effect in Hebrew. <laughs> or, or maybe, boo. <laughs> but we're going to get their attention one way or another. And here's the deal. If they chase us, that's the most obvious thing they'll do. They'll come roaring down the hill, chase them away. Well, we'll know that, that God doesn't mean us to have the victory today. And we'll hightail it out of there if they come chasing us. If, on the other hand, they say, hi, guys, come up for tea. Or words to that effect. If they invite us up, they say, come up here and we'll show you something. We will know that God has given them into our hands. That was his plan. It was an audacious plan. It was unbelievable that it would actually come to completion. But that was the plan that Jonathan came up with. Well, the second thing about the story as we read it is the rationale of faith, because Jonathan gives us a rationale for his decision to act. And I need to say something about this decision to act. Jonathan is, is driven by the fact that he already knows what God's purpose is. We've been learning right through this book that God, when he brought Israel into the promised land, had given them a task, that is, to, to conquer all the tribes in, in Israel. That was their job description. And they hadn't done it. They'd left the Philistines. They'd never really conquered the Philistines. And they'd been a plague, a thorn in their side for years. And now they'd appointed a king, Saul. God had given the king one job description. The king had God's authority, and he had to do one job, and that is to destroy the Philistines. Saul had opportunity, but he never did that. When other people attacked, he was good, and he reacted to that, but, but he never did anything about the Philistines. Nothing has happened. Jonathan knows that. He knows it's God's will to rid the country of the Philistines. Now, don't get bogged down in this. If this is new to you, don't get bogged down here, because in what God is doing at this period in the history of the world is he's teaching through these very physical, very earthy means, the principles that will be useful to us in our spiritual relationship with God. We need to see it in concrete terms. These are people living in the Bronze Age. He's teaching them in these very concrete ways the principles of a relationship with him that are transferable into our personal lives. And, and we see this at work here. You know, there are some things you don't have to pray about. Did you know that? There are some issues that you will face in life that you never, ever need to pray about. Presented with the opportunity of uh, fudging your income tax return. Will you do it? Will you not? You don't have to pray about that. You know what to do. The Bible says you shall not steal. God doesn't need to repeat himself. You pray about it, he'll still say that. You have the, the opportunity to commit adultery. You don't have to pray about that either. You want to run off from your family with somebody else and set up home. You don't have to pray about that. Let me tell you. That answer is already there. 
You can pray about it till you're blue in the face. You don't, will not change the answer that God will give you. There are some things you don't need to pray about. Jonathan did not need to pray about the Philistine question because God had revealed what should be done. But I want you to look at his faith because biblical faith has its reasons. Look what he says to the young man. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. So what's the theme? The theme is salvation. That's been coming up over and over again in this book. Salvation from enemies. God gives salvation from enemies. Here's one of the clearest statements in the Bible of faith. It's a declaration of his trust from God. Now, where did he get this faith? He didn't get this faith from his dad. His dad didn't really believe God. He didn't get his faith from his circumstances. It wasn't that everything was going the right way and simply he was going with the flow of circumstances and was bound to be successful. Nor did he get his faith because it was the in thing to do, that everybody at this point in the history of Israel was believing God. Everybody is going to church. Everybody is really up for believing in God. It wasn't like that. Everybody had deserted. Everybody had gone to hide, including the king and these 600 men. Everybody had given up on faith in God. It wasn't the popular thing to do. So where did his faith come from? Well, it came from the place where faith always comes from. Came as the gift of God. Paul says in Ephesians 2, faith is the gift of God. It's something he gives to you. It's not something you work up yourself. It's something God gives you as his generous gift. And what does true faith look like? Well, it's never driven simply by circumstances, and it's, it's never driven by what's obvious or visible or apparent. It doesn't look to circumstances. It looks to God and to God alone. Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees and looks to God alone, laughs at impossibilities and cries, it shall be done. Look how faith reasons. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. God can save people. He can do it. It's his business. God can do it. He can accomplish it. There is nothing that can hinder the Lord from saving. And on that premise, he enlarges. It may be that the Lord will work for us today. And he'll use his usual method. He'll work through people, his servants, by many or by few. Now, I want you to walk through this reasoning with me for a moment, because this helps you and I to understand how faith works. Look what he says. First of all, here's his premise. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. Here's his application to himself. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Now, I want you to see how he's arguing here. First of all, there's something he has absolutely no doubt about. God is a saving God. God can do whatever he wants. God can do anything and nothing can hinder the Lord. That's where we start. We start with the facts of the resurrection of Jesus. God raised Jesus from the dead. There is nothing that can hinder God from saving. He raised Jesus. He will raise Jesus' people. Nothing can hinder the Lord. That means nothing can alter his purpose. Nothing can thwart his plans. Nothing can frustrate his will. The Bible's full of this teaching. Is anything too hard from the Lord? I know that you can do all things, the Bible says. Nothing is impossible with God. With God, all things are possible, even the Lord Jesus. Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Jonathan was absolutely convinced that God could accomplish his will, that he could do it by many or by few, using means or without using means, using lots of means or using minimalist means. God can do his will. But do you see what he does not do? What Jonathan does not do? Convinced as he is that God can do what he wants, he does not presume to know the secret will of God. He has no insight into the decrees of God. He knows that God can save, but he doesn't know whether God is going to save at this point. It may be that God will do this. That's why the maybe is in there. He doesn't know the secret will of God. He can argue from what God can do, but he cannot be certain what God will do at this moment because God doesn't tell us that. That's God's secret. We find it afterwards. 
and we wait for it. Now, this has a lot of application, doesn't it, to the way in which we think of believing in God and praying to God today. There is, around us in the church of Jesus Christ globally, there's an arrogant style of so-called faith where people claim things from God, or they name things, and they think that simply by naming it before God, they will make it happen. They will speak it, as it were, into reality. There are those who will say to you that if you pray and you add in your prayer the words, if it be your will, that that is a failure of faith. Well, they should tell that to the Lord Jesus, shouldn't they? When he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, I will that you take this cup from me. Nevertheless, whatever you will, whatever you will. So apparently the Lord Jesus has no problem praying in the will of God because in his humanity, in a sense, like us, we cannot see the secret decree of God. What does true faith do when it prays? True faith submits to the will of God. True faith says, I know you can heal. I know you can save. I know you can do a great miracle here. I know that you can accomplish a great work here. And it may be that you will do this, and I want you to do this, but please do your will and help me to submit to your will, to gladly receive from you what your will is. True prayer is not about me changing God's mind. True prayer is not me doing what some people do. I've heard them do this in prayer meetings. Lord, we're believing you. We're believing you to do X, Y, or Z. We're believing you to accomplish this or to do that or to work this. As if somehow by talking to God that way, we are painting him into a corner so that he has no alternative but to do what we want him to do. We're not free to do that kind of thing. You know, if we want try to browbeat God into doing what we want... We, it would, it would be the wrong thing. It would be the wrong thing. Because I don't have the mind of God. I don't have the global view of God. I can't see the big picture that God sees. Sometimes if we have our will, it's worse for us. Jonathan says, it may be, and the may be still holds. And the may be holds when Jonathan and his friend are climbing down through the brambles and climbing up the slippery slope. And when they burst out and they identify themselves to the Philistine soldiers, it may be still holds. It could be death for, for Jonathan and his armor bearer that day. The may be still holds. But even with the may be, he is convinced the Lord can save. The Lord can save. It is the nature of real faith. It trusts anyway. It believes anyway. It, it relies on God anyway. And it does what it has to do to obey the word of God and the will of God anyway, whatever the cost is going to be personally. That's tough, isn't it? But there's real faith at work in the situation. Now, here's the contrast with faith. The third thing. The contrast with faith is his father, Saul. Now, in this chapter, we find... Let me just summarize. We find Saul suddenly going all religious on us. He's been a man noted for lack of religion. I mean, at the very beginning of the story, first time we meet him, he doesn't even know there is a prophet in Israel. He doesn't seem to even know Samuel's name. He certainly doesn't know that Samuel came from the town. And when he arrives at that town, he has absolutely no idea that Samuel is there, what Samuel means, what he is, other than just a a seer or a soothsayer or whatever, he seems to be completely devoid of any interest at all in spiritual things. In fact, the only really spiritual thing he did, he did in disobedience. And that was recorded in the previous chapter. But suddenly, he becomes very religious. He, he calls a fast, for example, a religious activity. He gets the army and says, you're not, you're not to eat anything until the Philistines are, are defeated. And when the Philistines are eventually defeated, he's concerned because the people immediately, because they now know that the, that the call for a fast is over, they slaughter the animals and they eat the meat with the blood still in it. That was forbidden in the Jewish law. And then he, he builds an altar. The very first altar he's ever built, he builds an altar to God. He goes for guidance. Normally, Samuel has come along and has given him guidance from the Word of God. But he goes to the oracle and he seeks guidance from God, although God didn't need to give him any guidance. He already knew what the will of God was, which was to pursue the Philistines. When the oracle says nothing, he assumes 
Not that he is to blame somehow, that God isn't talking to him, but he assumes that somebody else has done something wrong, and he decides that his son Jonathan is the problem. And by the end of the chapter, he's sentencing Jonathan to death. Jonathan, his own son, the man who'd got the victory that day, he sentenced him to death. So much so that he provokes, Saul provokes outrage among his own followers, and they, they stand up for Jonathan, and Jonathan is kept alive. Two things are happening in the chapter. One, suddenly this man who has no interest in obeying God's word is getting interested in the picky little details of the law of God. And the more interested in the little details of the law of God he gets, the more foolish he is in the way he applies them. I mean, imagine saying to soldiers who have been fighting all morning, who are now in full headlong chase of their enemy, chasing them out of the country. They're going full tilt saying, you mustn't have a coffee break. Don't take any water. Have nothing to eat. You don't need a sugar boost. You don't need energy to keep this going so that you can get them right out of the land. He's an absolute fool. That's what Samuel had said to him. You're foolish. Because once you subtract God from your life, folly is the way. You see, to be wise is to know God. It's the way of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But where there is no fear of God, what's left? Saul, rather, you find in this chapter, is becoming more and more religious. And the question is, why is he doing it? And the answer is in the previous chapter, he's been given a fright. Samuel has just told him he's going to lose his kingdom. Not him personally, but the kingdom that he has is not going to go to his son. It's not going to become a dynasty. And he's been given a fright. So what do you do? What do you do if you're a believer and you're warned about the wrath of God? What do you do? Well, you see that you've done wrong. You recognize where you've gone wrong. You recognize your disobedience. You you get down on your knees or you go to someone and you say, look, I've, I've taken the wrong track in my life and, and I realize that, that I put myself first instead of God and I, I really want to repent of this and turn from this and I, I want to get back into a close relationship with God again. And That's what you do if you're a believer. But if you're not a believer, what do you do? Saul had it in his mind that what he needed to do was to get the bits of religion right in his life. Yeah, he needed to make sure he went to church maybe at least once a Sunday, and maybe that he read his Bible, maybe if I read my Bible, it's, or pray. All the bits, the exterior bits. The further away from God we get, the more focused some people become on the trivia that surrounds Christianity. The things that don't really matter, that are not central to the Word of God, suddenly just the ascetics become more important or the externals become more important than the real thing. In this chapter, you see these two men, and they're going, they're going in the opposite direction from each other. Here's Jonathan demonstrating that he really has a relationship with God. I know, I know the Lord can save. And you have Saul ticking all the boxes but becoming a cause of misery to the people. You know, increasingly, as you read the story, you find him becoming a, a great source of misery to the people. These folk had been working, and now they're exhausted. They're terrified. The curse is coming on the nation. They never really defeat the enemies. This time, they had them on the run. If they'd only pursued, if they'd pressed the matter, it would have been once and for all. The Philistines would have been out of the picture altogether. But no, they're going to stay there for a while. Why? Because Saul didn't believe. No Falling Word is produced by the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals and features the teaching of Liam Gallagher, pastor of 10th Presbyterian Church in Center City, Philadelphia. We'd love to invite you to visit 10th Press any Sunday morning for either the 9 a.m. or the 11 a.m. service. Or you could also come by in the evening to hear Liam live from the pulpit at 6.30 p.m. You'll find the church at 17th and Spruce Streets. To learn more about No Falling Word and our parent organization, the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals, 
Call us today at 1-800-488-1888. While you're on the phone with us, let us know you were listening in and we'll send you today's free gift for our listeners as well. It's an MP3 download of a great message from Derek Thomas entitled Solus Christus. This message was originally one of a series of messages presented at a conference on the five solas that make up the pillars of Reformed theology. We hope that you enjoy tuning in each week to hear our broadcasted messages from Liam. This program exists to share the truth of God's Word through the radio waves, and we're excited about the mission that God has given us to call the church back to Christ-centered worship. If you would like to stand with us in supporting the work of this ministry, there are a few easy ways to do so. First, check out our website, nofallingword.org. While you're there, you can shop from a wide selection of books, CDs, DVDs, MP3 downloads, and more. You can also use our site to make a one-time tax-deductible financial gift to this ministry. Or if you prefer, you can donate right over the phone when you call in for your free MP3 download of Solus Christus. We thank you in advance for your generous support. It's only because of you that this program can stay on the air and remain commercial free. Join us again next week for No Falling Word as we take a break from our current series through 1 Samuel to spend some time preparing our hearts and minds for Christmas. We'll look at how the Christ child, born of a virgin, would grow to know the reality and depth of every human emotion. 